It's the last Sunday before Christmas, and that means it's day 21 of Hutvent 2025. And today's film was going to be made by Lindsay, but sadly she's poorly at the moment, so she's gutted that she can't do this because it was one she was really looking forward to. But today we're going to look at the Lewis gun, because to be honest, you can't make a whole series of films about 1915 bits of kit and not mention the Lewis gun. The Lewis gun was designed by an American, Colonel Isaac Newton Lewis, and what a splendid name that was, in 1911. And the American army were not in the slightest bit interested. So eventually he found his way over to Europe and he goes to Belgium and the Belgians are very keen to make them. However, the war breaks out in 1914, so then the opportunity moves over to Britain. And these are eventually made by the Birmingham Small Arms Factory, BSA, in Birmingham. And they enter service with the British Army in 1915 and prove a really, really useful addition. It's the first light machine gun that the British Army have. Portable firepower, proper firepower at last. To be pedantic, it's not a machine gun at all. It's actually an automatic rifle by definition of how it works. But generally speaking, you get the idea. It's lots and lots of firepower um, in one piece of kit. The ammunition was supplied in these circular drums or pans, whatever you want to call them, uh, which sat on the top with 47 rounds in. And um, there was a 90, 97 round version for aircraft. And, uh, and the aircraft one didn't have this jacket on. The barrel was exposed because it, uh, it, it was kept cool flying through the air. And the way that the barrel was kept cool uh, with, with, with the ordinary guns is that inside here, the barrel runs up the center of this jacket with veins all the way around it. And as you fire it, the explosion of the bullet at that end, leaving the barrel, sucks air through the veins at this end, and the cool air passes through and keeps it cool. It's clever stuff. And as you fire you the rounds off, the magazine turns, and as it spins, the empty rounds are then thrown out the side quite some distance as it then picks up the next round and puts it in. The, there would be a team of them, and the numbers in the team vary throughout the war, so there's no point in quoting a specific but basically you always had a gunner and a number two, and the number two carried the spare parts bag, the number one carried the gun, and the number two was always on the left-hand side of the gun because the rounds were spitting out on the right. And as the magazine was empty and the gun stopped firing, the gunner who was firing it would then take the, gun off, the magazine off the top of the gun, he would pass the empty one underneath, and the number two would then put the full one on top, ready for him to carry on firing. Now, in order to load them, there was a specific way of doing that because the magazine underneath had a spiral design to carry those 47 rounds, but there was a, a clutch to stop the center turning. So in order to make it turn so you could load it, you had to have a loading tool, which you put into a slot there like that. And when you pushed it down, it released the clutch so that you could turn the center so that it was able to be loaded. And then you'd take your 303 rounds, there were slots on the side of the magazine, which you would sit them in, and then turn the magazine to the next one. And you could do this really, really quickly with practice and experience, which once upon a time I could do, and I can't anymore. And as you see, the thing gradually starts filling up with the 47 rounds. We'll just put five in just so you get the idea. And once you've loaded it with your 47 rounds, the magazines had got a, a marking on, a, a, a sort of off-white or a khaki marking to tell you that that was the side nearest to you, to give you a hand in semi-darkness or in the dark so that you could roughly see which way round it went. And then you'd sit it back on the gun like that. And then when you cocked it, if you watch it, as I pull the cocking handle back, you'll see the magazine turn ready to line it up to put the next round in. I won't pull the trigger, it's deactivated and, uh, and the round can't go anywhere, but you get the idea. The rate of fire was 600 rounds a minute, although bearing in mind every 47 rounds you need to change it, but generally speaking, you would always just fire it in short bursts. But it was a very, very practical piece of kit. It meant that you could carry it across no man's land in an advance, and from a distance, it would just look like you'd carried in a rifle. So it was difficult to spot them and pick them off if you're a German soldier. 
The Germans loved them as well. If they had the opportunity to capture them, they would rechamber them to fire their ammunition. And, um, and they were also made uh, by all sorts of other countries. Uh, the Americans made them under license during the war as well uh, for the British uh, and, uh, and British and Commonwealth armies. But after the war, there are all sorts of other nations that, that, war, that, that used them as well. Uh, the British Army still had some in use in 1937 when uh, they were effectively replaced by the Bren gun and they still saw service with the Home Guard and with um, and sort of anti-aircraft um, units on ships and all sorts of things uh, pretty much through until the end of the Second World War when they disappear pretty much completely from British service use. It was a popular piece of kit, it's a bit of a lump to carry, uh, but actually as far as the fellows were concerned on the battlefield it was a very very useful addition to the armoury that they got.